This podcast video is about the place of narrative in generating and explaining a landscape design. I'll start by placing the issue in context and then move on to three ways in which the design of a Himalayan school can be narrated. To abstract means to withdraw something from something. In the case of abstract art, the thing abstracted was visual design. The things left behind in what Trotsky called the dustbin of history were figurative content and narrative content. The results became known as abstract art. Some people say that it converted art into graphic design. I don't agree with this, but abstract art did have a profound influence on many types of design. Effectively, they became more abstract than abstract art. Garden and landscape design also became abstract, but compared to, say, architecture and interior design or furniture design, they were less affected. This podcast, you may be pleased to hear, is not about the history or theory of art and design. It's about a design project which I began working on as a volunteer when I retired in 2012. The project was for a large school in a beautiful valley surrounded by mountains which are higher than any in Europe or America. The design process began with a sketch by the client, a Buddhist monk. It was drawn in a nomad tent at a high altitude in a cold desert, which has been called the home of the winds. The concept was then developed by architects, engineers, landscape architects and other professions, working together in a Buddhist-influenced, collective, non-self design process. The design drawings have some of the qualities of an abstract design, but they resulted from a narrative approach. I'll explain the designs in three ways. As an abstract pattern, as a design narrative, and as a children's story, written by me for the end users, the school children. In abstract terms, the heart of the design is a square. As Kazimir Malevich wrote, the square is not a subconscious form. It is the creation of intuitive reason, the face of the new art. He also wrote that, in 1913, trying desperately to liberate art from the ballast of the representational world, I sought refuge in the form of the square. The Druk White Lotus Square is contained within a circle, as Vasily Kandinsky wrote. The circle is the synthesis of the greatest opposites. It combines concentric and eccentric in a soul form and keeps it in balance. Of the three primary planes triangle, square, circle, it most clearly points on the fourth dimension, time. Beyond the circle of the Druk school, fragmented curves flow into the landscape. As Piet Mondrian wrote, Curves are so emotional. The truly modern artist is aware of abstraction in an emotion of beauty. These quotations indicate to me that modern art was not as free of symbols and narratives as one might think. The second account of the design for the Druk White Lotus School rests on symbolic, geographical and functional narratives. This version was published on YouTube in 2015. The Druk White Lotus School began in 1992 with the villagers of Shea asking their local monastery for help. Their request was supported by Tuxi Rinpoche and taken up 
by the Gyawang Drukpa. You can think of them as a bishop and an archbishop of a Buddhist lineage. Through an English art teacher, Annie Smith, they found two young architects to help with the design. Jonathan Rose and Duncan Woodburn were both working for Arab at the time. They wanted the design to be culturally appropriate and they wanted it to be sustainable. Design historians would be right to see this as a shift from modernism to postmodernism, which Charles Jenks explains as double coding. The first code is good design, and the second code is a culture and a worldview rooted in Buddhism. The school, however, is secular, and the garden is not a sacred space. There's no contradiction in this because before the East came under Western influence, there was really no distinction between sacred and secular. Both are a part of nature, both are subject to natural law, the Buddha Dharma. The school design was based on a diagram drawn by the spiritual leader of the Drukpa lineage, His Holiness the Gyawang Drukpa. He drew the diagram in a nomad tent in a place like this. Buddhist monks learn about diagrams because the Buddha used them to explain his ideas. So as part of their teaching, monks draw and make sand mandalas. The word mandala means cycle and was used for the chapters, the cantos, of the oldest text in any Indo-European language. The Rig Veda was composed about 1500 BC. A great Buddhist scholar, Giuseppe Tucci explained that a mandala is a map of the cosmos. Cosmos means much the same as universe, but stresses its order rather than its physical character. For Buddhists, the key principles are the four noble truths. The truth of suffering, the truth of the origin of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering, and the truth of the noble eightfold path to enlightenment. Following this path will take you from the world of samsara, the everyday world, to the world of nirvana, where you will enjoy peace beyond desire. Some Buddhist schools think nirvana is attainable on earth. So, on a mandala diagram, the area outside the ring represents the world of samsara, and the area inside the ring represents the world of nirvana, reached by earning good karma through good behaviour on earth. This cosmic geography is also symbolised by the lotus flower. A lotus is born in a sea of mud and symbolises enlightenment by opening into a world of beauty and sunlight. That's why it's called the White Lotus School. And that's why we hope to have a large paved lotus in the central courtyard. An appreciation of nature is at the heart of the design and at the heart of the school's teaching. The University of Greenwich became involved with the design after a cloudburst and a great flood in 2010. It deposited a metre of mud over the much of the side and destroyed most of the planting. The rain was so hard it cut human flesh. This led to a requirement for a flood protection wall and created a space which could become a garden. As landscape architects, we wanted to grow the mandala idea by including aspects of the everyday world in the design, and we also wanted to reflect the Drukpa heritage in the design. Drukpa means dragon, and the Drukpa emblem shows the treasures of Buddhism protected by two dragons. This led to the first landscape plan by Simon Drury Brown, which has dragon shelter belts forming an enclosure and helping to protect the site from winds and floods. The cultural symbolism is very important, but so are other aspects of the landscape strategy. The first necessity was water. We'd like to have used the traditional Ladakhi system, which is flood irrigation, but it's only 20% efficient compared to 80% for a drip system. So the drips won. The irrigation strategy corresponds to a strategy for soils and vegetation. It's based on hydrozones with different levels of irrigation used to create different habitats. 
and habitats which correspond to the everyday soil and vegetation types of Ladakh. The integration of water, soils, vegetation and symbols produced the landscape plan. The planting strategy is to use native plants wherever possible, but exotic species where they can do a job which native plants cannot do. Cosmos and marigolds, for example, are popular garden plants in the Dag, with a long flowering season. But native plants from the local area are the best species for the drier hydrozones. The paving strategy also derives from the local environment. The school's in the middle of the Indus Satya zone. This is the zone of collision between the Indian subcontinent and Laurasia. The impact of the collision released an upsurge of magma which became a granite batholith and is now the Ladakh range. This is where our granite building stone comes from. To the south of the Satya zone, the Zanskar mountains were formed from the floor of Tethys Ocean. It has been compressed into sedimentary layers and now provides our slate paving. So, in the garden, as in the wider landscape, we will have granite rising out of slate. You could compare this with how, in ancient Egypt, mud was used for dwellings and stone was used to build temples. So, let's have a look at what's been done so far. The school is in the centre of this panorama, beyond the white stupas, with the river Indus, from which India takes its name, flowing through the trees on the right. Geographers describe the landscape as a cold desert. The original idea was to place stupas around the Mandala Ring. Our present hope is to have four abstract white lotus sculptures, which Richard Deacon has kindly offered to make. The brilliant white outlines of the stupas echo the mountains which rise over 2,000 metres above the school. This clip gives an idea of what the site would be like without irrigation and without vegetation. It'd be a cold desert. Here's a tree-lined avenue watered by kitchen waste, which leads from the site entrance to the present visitor centre. We hope to build a new one. This was the first visit to the nursery by His Eminence and His Holiness, whose full support for the project continues. And here is a first visit by a group of dragons to the Dragon Garden. They're said to live in the abode of snow, the Himalayas. Outdoor wall painting is characteristic of the Himalayan region, and we want to carry the tradition forward. Here are some young dragons in the adventure playground. We could have brought play equipment from elsewhere in India, but it's nicer to make it on site and it can then be maintained on site. As everywhere, children prefer swings and seesaws to static features. You can see a well-designed but hardly used shelter. Believing the sport of car tire rolling was invented here, we hope to create a rough track and to produce world champions. The football pitch is probably in need of some more work, but there's something great about playing among the rocks. Note the tyre rollers. The school used flood irrigation before we had a drip system, and most of the water was lost in the coarse granitic sand. Here's Setan turning on the drip irrigation and then adjusting the drip lines. Drip lines also supply the nursery, which we had to build because few plants are available from commercial nurseries in Ladakh. You can see what may be the world's highest landscape architecture office in the corner of the nursery. The lettering on the stone in the nursery is the most famous Buddhist prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum, Hail to the Jewel of the Lotus. Ornamental grasses have become popular in European gardens. We think this is stipa, but the plants are from Satan's field and weren't labelled. He says we could sell bundles of grass for roofing and sweeping for about 500 rupees each. We have about the same number of tourists per year as Wobin Abbey, 60,000, 
and do not know if they see the waving grass as beautiful or as weeds. Nor do we know if the native plants make the 400 residential children feel more at home in the school. I suspect both groups prefer flowers. Cosmos and Tajitis are Mexican plants, but a popular way of providing colour in Ladaki gardens. The dragon shelter belts will be planted with buckthorn and Himalayan rose. Rosa macrophylla is astonishingly drought tolerant. Here are the infants going for lunch. Shade is very important, not so much because of the heat, but because of the glare. I can hardly go out of doors without a big hat and extra dark sunglasses. You can see sustainability in action here. Organic matter is recycled wherever possible. There's a pile of human manure, kindly supplied by the 800 children. And here are the orchard trees, which will supply fruit and then more manure. You can see one of our VIP toilets. That's a ventilated improved pit. Ladakh is famous for its apples. They're stored in deep pits and provide an important source of winter vitamins. We run an annual garden competition with entries from each class. If, as seems possible, Ladakh becomes the Switzerland of India, gardening could become an important transferable skill for the children. The central court in which the garden competition awards are being given out is the proposed location for the disc of white lotus paving we saw earlier. We've made a lookout in the children's playground and we propose a more substantial lookout in the flood wall to let visitors gaze at the fantastic geology and beauty of the Indus Valley landscape. I'll finish with a comment on the design team. I've been involved for almost four years and my impression is of a very friendly, cooperative and effective group. There are several possible reasons. First, and in line with the Buddhist concept of anatta, non-self, we see ourselves as no more than eddies in a flow. The river is what matters. Second, the team follows the principle advocated by the Egyptian architect Hassan Fati that the designers, the builders and the client must work closely together. Third, and what you see here, is an example of following the advice from Humphrey Repton, the great landscape architecture theorist. He wrote that the plan should be made not only to fit the spot, it ought actually to be made upon the spot. So the best thing is to turn off your computers, get down on your knees and draw. As you've seen, the design method used multiple layers and could be classified as a narrative landscape urbanism approach. The third account of the design for the Druk White Lotus School deals with an aspect of the design narrative which might interest the school children, a terrible flood. It opens with an introduction by Phil Cornwall, who managed the design process for a decade. He was an engineer by training and had worked for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This narrative was published on YouTube in 2014. <laughs>
This is Shay, ancient capital of Ladakh. This is Dragon Country. Welcome to Druk Pemakalpo School, Druk White Lotus School. Why did dragons like gardens? asked the baby dragon. I'll tell you, said the green dragon of Shea. It's because we love snowy mountains. Nothing is better than swooping from the sky, whooshing with the wind, rolling in snow and dancing in thunderstorms. It cleans the soot off your scales. Sounds great said the baby dragon, but what's that got to do with gardens? Ah, said the green dragon of Shea. Plants help prevent the global warming which is melting our snow. How? asked the baby dragon. Well, said the green dragon, all our friends have mobile phones. So we can speak to dragons around the world, and they say humans are causing the problem. The poor things can't fly and can't breathe fire. So they can't keep cool when it's hot or warm when it's not, like we do. So they cut down trees and burn oil and fill the air with CO2. Then the sun melts our ice. It's terrible. You must do something, said the baby dragon. I better had, said the green dragon of Shea. So he went to speak to the wise old dragon. Having always been old and having always been wise, the wise old dragon was pleased to speak to the young dragons who had always been young. So they all grumbled together about hot sun and melting snow. You're right, droned the wise old dragon. Things are so much worse now. Once upon a time every dragon had a private cloud. Tonight, so many of us will have to sleep in deserts that people are calling us the dusty dragons. Dust gets between your scales and makes you itch. It's horrible. What can we do to stop humans wrecking the planet? asked the young dragons. Give them a scare, laughed the wise old dragon. Whoopee! yelled the young dragons. How do we do it? With claps of thunder, said the wise old dragon. Whoopee, 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 said the young dragons. But I don't make thunder, said the wise old dragon. That's a job for naggers, and you'll have to give them presents if you want a thunderstorm. What can we give them? asked the young dragons. Either jewels or chocolate, said the wise old dragon. But chocolate is bad for their teeth, so give them jewels. How do we get jewels? asked the young dragons. You look for them. I once spent a million years collecting rubies and emeralds. Now it's getting so warm that you lot are becoming lazy. I can see a time when you won't even breathe fire to keep warm. You must go on a jewel hunt. So the young dragons went to search the mountains for treasure. It was slow work, but fun. And they were soon flapping about with fistfuls of gemstones. And those who couldn't find gems collected flowers. The next job was to find the Naga King. This was done by choosing a grassy meadow beside a great lake and using it to make a mandala pattern with gemstones and flowers. When the Naga King heard about this, he couldn't resist going to have a peep. 
living at the bottom of a lake can be gloomy, and naggers yearn for bright colours. When his head popped out of the lake, the oldest young dragon called out, Can we speak to you for a minute? What do you want? the nagger king grumped. Thunder and lightning, they told him. Ladakh doesn't need any more lightning. It's being modernised and there are electric lights everywhere, he said. But we need thunder, said the young dragons. Look, if we give you all our gems and all our flowers, will you ask all the naggers to make thunder? That's different, said the nagger king. We'll do it next week. So the dragons handed over the presents and the king shared them out among the naggers, asking them to make a really good thunderstorm. It began at midnight on the 5th of August 2010 with a horrendous flash of lightning. This produced a great roar from the wise old dragon and screams of delight from the young dragons. Booms and crashes echoed through the valleys. Continuous flashes of lightning turned night into day. Deluges of water fell on the hills. Valleys were flooded. The young dragons squelched with joy as all the dust and soot was washed from their scales. No more itching, no more itching, they yelled with glee. But the storm was bad for humans. Bridges were destroyed. Houses were swept away. Telephones stopped working. People died. Children cried. The dragons did not like this. And they were particularly sad about the damage to the Druk White Lotus School. It was half buried in mud. And the wise old dragon was terribly upset. I am not going to die, he said. But if I was, then I would want to go to Nirvana. I've seen pictures of the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas in Nirvana. They have a wonderful garden with a lotus pond and jewels and flowers. A dragon school needs a dragon garden. It would help prevent global warming. And we should help them make it. They need dragon aid. Come on, dragons. Who can help them to make a garden? I can, said the dragon of the rivers. You must have water, and my secret is to apply it drip by drip. Okay, said the dragon of the hills. But you won't be able to do much without me. My secret is to make garden soil by mixing sand, clay and vegetable matter. OK, OK, said the dragon of the valleys. But you'll need me too. When you have soil and water, I will bring plants from the Indus Valley and from the hills to grow for the Druk school. My secret is to use the right plant in the right place. OK, 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 said the dragon of the snows. But don't forget me. I keep a secret river flowing beneath the school, and I can let you have some of my water if you make me a tube well. My secret is an ice reservoir. It is high in the mountains and has lots of water. The four dragons agreed to work together sometime, but decided to have a long sleep before doing anything. Just as they were dozing off, a great boom was heard high above. 
Ah, it said, have you forgotten me? It was the wise old dragon of the skies. He'd been about to fall asleep when he had another idea. If dragons do all the work, they will lose their hard-earned reputation for being even lazier than children. Ah, we must get children from the Druk school to help make the garden, he said. Hmm, what can children do? The other dragons muttered. They can put in plants, the wise old dragon said. And they can collect stones for the paths. Look at the Drukpa emblem. It has the three jewels of Buddhism, two mighty dragons, a dharma wheel and a lotus pool. So schoolchildren must know about Buddhism and about gardens. The emblem explains that the Buddha set the wheel in motion. It turns once for hearing, once for understanding and once for learning. Those who follow the Noble Eightfold Path can reach Nirvana, the condition of peace beyond desire. Many years later, two schoolchildren were walking in the dragon's garden. It was lush, beautiful, rich with fruit, gay with flowers, buzzing with bees and singing with birds. The green dragon of Shea was having an afternoon snooze in the bushes. He opened one portion of one ear and heard a conversation between the children. What do you want to be when you grow up? asked the first child. A landscape architect, said his friend. Humans must look after the planet as carefully as they look after their gardens. But we also need wild places, and we should mark them on maps, as sailors used to do with the Latin words. Hic sunt draconis. Here be dragons. Yes, please, said the green dragon of Shea, as he went back to sleep in the shade of the wild roses in the shelter belt on the edge of the Druk garden. Well, thanks for listening. If interested, you can find more of my views on the gardenvisit.com and Landscape Architecture YouTube channels and websites. Or you can subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast player to hear future podcasts about designing cities, landscapes and gardens. <laughs> <laughs>